This video is to continue with the initial step of choosing a cause and an effect to model. And you should have already watched part one of this video, which is called choosing a cause and effect to model. And uh, so what we've said in that one is that I've decided that what I want to model, my initial idea, which is still quite vague, is that I want to model t tobacco smoke as my cause, and my outcome is going to be something related to the health of the lungs. So let's go over to the Enhance website to see what are the possibilities for this kind of model. Okay, here on the InHaines website, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to questionnaires, data sets, and related documentation. And I'm going to go back to the survey contents that we looked at earlier. And what I want to do is I want to begin looking for variables that I can use to represent tobacco smoke exposure and also something related to the health of lungs. And before I start, one thing I want to mention is that um, one of the requirements for the model that uh, you're going to build is that you need to take data from two consecutive uh, cycles of the data uh, that are uh, shown here. And by cycle, I mean the two-year cycle. They actually collect data in each year, but they release them in two-year cycles. So, for example, you would need to use data from 1999 to 2000 in addition to 2001, 2002. So what you're going to be looking for is you're going to be looking for variables that are in two consecutive cycles, and it doesn't matter which ones you use. Now, at the time that I'm making this video, uh, at the beginning of 2014, um, these data, 2013 and 2014, although they're planned, um, they haven't been released yet. But the, the 2011, 2012, even in this section, there are some missing data. So you want to uh, make sure that the data that you want to use have actually been released. Um, so I'm going to, though, I'm going to limit myself to the years 1999 to 2010 um, for uh, now at the beginning of 2014. Um, because those data appear to be complete. So <clears throat> the first thing I did when I uh, was looking at these is I, I looked for information about lung health. And I found here in the examination components of the survey, um, I found this section which was called respiratory health. And there are two sections under respiratory health. One was exhaled nitric oxide and the other was spirometry. And both of them were measured on people in the survey who were between the ages of six and 79 years. That's the whole um, survey. And you can see here that the data were collected in 2007 and 2008 and also in 2009, 2010. So it also meets the condition of the two consecutive cycles of data. So I looked at both of these and, and I've, you know, I've probably spent about three hours or so uh, doing some background uh, research on these different things. And um, spirometry is the one that I've decided to use. So let's just look at spirometry. So one of the things that I did was um, I know now that the the data are found in the 2007, 2008, and also the 2009, 2010. So what I did first was I went to the um, front page again, and again, I'm on the questionnaires, data sets, and related documentation. Actually, it's not the front page, it's, it's this page. And down here, what you'll find is that there are data sets and documentation uh, for each of the cycles. And so I, my, potential data are in these two cycles. So I just chose the earlier one. And then what happens when you do that is on the left-hand side here, you'll see that the different sections of the data are listed here. Now the spirometry data are in the examination data. So if you click on that, then you'll go through and you'll find um, all the different examination components that are um, <clears throat> included in that cycle. And down here you'll find there's the spirometry, there's two sections for spirometry. 
Um, this is the one that I want, and I just had to sort of look at both of them to figure that out. So what you'll find out here is, is that in, for each of these, there's a documentation file, and then there's the raw data file. So when we're ready to actually use the data, this is where we will come to download the data. These are the actual data. But for now, we're just interested in information. And so you click onto the documentation, and what's going to happen is you're going to come to this page. And this is where you, this is where you should start. On the, on the left-hand side, what you'll see is that they have really good descriptions of what the data are about. And here they explain spirometry. So this is a really a good place to get started. They also have at the bottom, they have references. And so these are a good place to, to, to start as well, to start digging into um, the information. So I also came to uh, PubMed and I typed in spirometry epidemiology and clicked on review. And this is a good way to sometimes to get uh, a kind of overview of using a particular type of variable in an epidemiology study. And I just scrolled through and I found a few um, that looked uh, interesting to me. Here was uh, something about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a worldwide problem. Uh, they just gave, I mean, gave me an overview. Um, and here was another one, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a concise review. And I started following these and inside these, I found other references. I just kind of kept following them. Um, those led me to uh, a paper um, that was uh, very useful, this one, which was called The Importance of the Assessment of Pulmonary Function in COPD. Um, I can't show this one um, because this is copyrighted material, so I can't post it on YouTube. Um, but this one gave me a, a, a very good background on some of the um, issues um, and methods related to spirometry data. And what spirometry data are are the results of a diagnostic test where they have someone taken uh, as deep a breath as possible and then they blow into a tube as they blow all of the air out of their lungs as quickly as they can. And what you get are a number of measures, two of which that I'm going to use, one being called the forced vital capacity. And this is sometimes abbreviated FVC. And the other measure is called the forced expiratory volume in the first second. And this is abbreviated FEV1. So the idea here is that if your airways are constricted, which is one of the characteristics of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and I'm going to call it COPD for short, then what will happen is that you'll be able to blow the air out of your lungs, but it will be slower. And so the percentage of the total volume of air that you can blow out will be less uh, in the first second compared to somebody who has no or less constriction in the airways in their lungs. So this information can be used to screen for COPD. And the way it's done is that you take the ratio of the FEV1 to FVC, and if it's less than 70%, then you uh, conclude that this is a person who potentially has COPD. So another criterion that the NHANES data used was to identify people who were below what's called the lower limit of normal, which is the bottom 5% of people classified according to their age, their race, their sex, and their height, as also potentially individuals who have COPD. Now, in addition to COPD, these could also be indicators of an individual who has asthma. And so in order to make a distinction between individuals who have COPD and individuals who have asthma, those people who met either of these criteria had a second test after inhaling a bronchodilator. And a bronchodilator will open your airways if you have asthma, but if you have COPD, then it won't open your airways. And so someone who meets one of these criteria after taking a bronchodilator is considered to have COPD. And if their airways open, then they're considered to have asthma. So let's think back to what I was planning to do with my model. And I had said that I wanted to test tobacco smoke as a cause and some effect on the lungs. And I said that I could choose 
an outcome variable, the lung side, that is either binary or continuous. Well, now I have a possibility for either kind of variable. On the binary side, I could use COPD, which is either yes or no. And it will be defined by seeing if either the FEV1 to FVC ratio is below 70% or the person is below the lower limit of normal. And then secondly, if the person does not respond to a bronchodilator in a second spirometry test. Now there's a possibility here for me to use a continuous measure, which is the FEV1 to FVC ratio itself. And what that represents is airway constriction. Now, of course, your variables are going to be different because you're going to be modeling something different. But this shows one principle that you might use in your own model planning. And what we find in the in Haines data is a lot of these examinations that were done in the mobile examination center. These are clinical tests which can be used to categorize someone as having a particular disease. And oftentimes these tests are a continuous measure. So for example, here we have the FEV1 to FVC ratio and it's a continuous measure. And if someone goes below a particular threshold, then they're considered to have the disease. Now there are other examples of this kind of thing in the NHANES. For example, they measured fasting glucose and insulin in participants in the NHANES, and they can use that to determine their level of insulin resistance. That's a continuous measure, but if people go above a particular threshold of insulin resistance, then they're considered to have diabetes. Another example is DEXA, dual energy x-ray absorptiometry. And this is a measure of bone density. This is a, also a continuous measure. And if someone's bone density goes below a particular threshold, then they're considered to have osteoporosis. So these kinds of measures, these, these clinical measures that are used to determine a disease, these actually are good measures to use in, in a model because what you have is that you begin to see people on the trajectory toward disease even before they have the disease. And so for example here, for something like smoking, you can imagine that someone starts out with their, they have a healthy lung function, they start smoking and their lung function, their airways are be slowly constricting over time. And as their airways slowly constrict, their FEV1 to FVC ratio will be getting lower. Now the airway constriction will be measurable long before they get full-fledged COPD. And so you can begin to see the effects of the tobacco smoke on their lungs long before they have the disease. So this is a good way to build a model. One reason is that it's you're using an indicator which is more sensitive because with COPD, individuals who have some degree of airway constriction, but who have not yet reached the threshold to be considered full-fledged COPD, they will simply be classified as no on the variable for COPD. And they'll be classified as no along with all of those people who have perfectly healthy lungs. Another thing we need to consider with a binary variable is what percentage of the people in the data set actually have the uh, disease that we're looking at. So how many people in the data set have COPD? I've already mentioned in a previous video that we should stay away from cancer as an outcome using these data for our model because for one reason, the number of people who have cancer in the data will be too few to allow us to build a good model. Now, if I want to know how many people in the data have COPD, I can come to the NHANES website and I can look directly at the frequencies for the data. I just go to questionnaires, data sets, and related documentation. I find the years where my data are and mine are in the 2007, 8 and the 2009 and 10. So what I want to do is I just want to open both of these and then the data and the examination data. So I want to open up the examination data for both of these years. And then I can go to the spirometry, open up the documentation file. So in the 2007 and 2008, I find that there's a variable here, which is um, this one, SPD bronch. 
which is the selected for bronchodilator. And I can see how many people in this cycle, 2007 and 8, who were selected for the second bronchodilator exam, which means that they had a an FEV1 to FEC ratio less than 70%, or they were below the lower limit of normal. And I can see here that 1,000 people out of 6,400, which is about 15%, were selected for the second test. And if I go to the 2009 and 2010 data, where is the variable? There it is. There's about 920 out of 7,100. So this is a little bit less, maybe around 13% or so. So I've got 15% and 13% of people who were selected for the bronchodilator. Now, some of these people are going to respond to the bronchodilator, so they're going to be classified as having asthma rather than having COPD. I don't exactly know how many that will be, and I'm going to have to go and calculate that. They, that, that variable is not included in the NHANES data set. But I found in one of the in one of the articles that I was reading that maybe uh, I can expect about a third of people to be asthma. So about two thirds of these people will uh, possibly have COPD. Now time will tell. I'll have to find out looking at the data directly. But thinking about whether or not there are enough people with COPD in these data for me to build my model, I think this should be no problem. Um, I think if if you have at a minimum, I would say around two hundred people. Um, then you're probably going to be okay to build a model. So I'm going to be well above that. So I don't anticipate any problems with that at all. Now, one thing I want to mention is that when you are doing research on your variables, you might come across information that describes the limitations of that particular kind of variable. And when you come across that kind of information, you have one of two choices. You can either choose to construct your variable in a different way that will make it better and minimize those limitations, or you can accept those limitations and go ahead and use that variable in your model. If you choose the latter, then you're going to have to remember that limitation and use that information as part of your interpretation of the uncertainty in your model. So if you come across that kind of information at this point, you should bring it up, talk about it in class, um, and we can work together to decide what you should do. Um, if you decide to incorporate or allow that kind of limitation in your model, then you should keep track of the sources where you found the information about that limitation because you're going to have to reference that at the end of the process when you interpret your model. Now, I had this kind of situation come up when I was looking at the information about how I'm planning to measure COPD in the population. So let me just explain it. So what I found is that there is an association between the FEV1 to FVC ratio and age. And you can see it here in this diagram. This is a diagram of um, shows graphically the, uh, a population, a hypothetical population. And each dot represents two variables for one person. So either, uh, the two variables are age and FEV1 to FVC ratio. For example, this dot represents a person who has about, is about 53 years old, and their FEV1 to FVC ratio is about 63%. And what we can see is we can see that the, the data are tending to move down to the right. And if you think back to the video, uh, which was about how we connect our model to reality, there we saw that if we see this kind of pattern where they're moving down to the right, that means that if we were to uh, graphically show the FEV1 to FVC ratio and additionally show the age, then we would see a kind of pattern where the variables are moving against each other. So as the age goes up, the FEV1 to FVC ratio is tending to go down. And we said that when we see this kind of pattern, we can hypothesize three kinds of causal relationships between the variables. One is that, that age is having a causal effect on the FEV1 to FVC ratio. Another, that the FEV1 to FVC ratio is having a causal effect on age. That one doesn't make much sense. And a third one is that there's confounding that's causing this kind of association between FEV1 and F FEV1 to FVC ratio and age, a third variable that's causing both of them to change.
So the, the theory here is that age actually has a causal effect on the FEV1 to FVC ratio. As we get older, our airways constrict somewhat as a natural process of aging. And so what happens here then is that using this kind of method of classifying COPD where individuals who have a <clears throat> have an FEV1 to FVC ratio below 70% and don't respond to a bronchodilator are classified as having COPD, this is going to cause a little bit of misclassification. So you can see here that these people down here that are in red or in pink, these are the individuals who are at the lower limit of normal for FEV1 to FVC for their particular age. And you can see down here that there are going to be some young people who actually have airway constriction who are going to be above the 70% uh, mark that we're using as our criterion. And so these individuals would be classified as not having COPD when in fact they should be classified as having COPD. Now in the NHANES data, they also used the lower limit of normal as one criterion to determine COPD. So for the young people, it will be okay in the NHANES data. But in contrast, down here with the older people, because their FEV1 to FEC ratio is decreasing with age, there's going to be some people here who are going to go below 70%, but in fact, they're not down here in the lower portion of the individuals, which is really where we want to classify COPD. So these people are going to be classified as having COPD when in fact, possibly they shouldn't be classified as having COPD. This kind of information problem is going to induce some bias into our model. It's going to be uh, information bias, and we'll learn more about that and how to think about it and how to talk about it when we're interpreting our results uh, later on. Now, if I was doing this model uh, to publish it, I probably would not accept this kind of information error in my model. I would probably choose to do more work to classify individuals for COPD in a, in a better way. But that's really beyond the scope of this course. And one of the things we actually want to learn here is that we want to learn how to talk about the uncertainty in our models that come from these kinds of things which show up in every model. We have information problems in every model. So this will give us a method by which we can learn about those kinds of things. So hopefully this will get you started uh, thinking about what you're going to use as your outcome variable in your model. And the next step is we will start looking at how to model the exposure variable.